At NASA, we're developing ways to safely accommodate the increasing traffic with diverse missions and complexity of our skies to make them more convenient than roads are today. Imagine aviation operations that can benefit everyone, those who fly and those who don't. Imagine choosing where you live or where to build your business without worrying about transportation limitations. Imagine a safe and affordable transportation system that embraces emerging trends in data science and intelligent autonomous systems. A world where aircraft are eco-friendly and where land can be used for green space instead of highways. Imagine a transportation system that will create new job opportunities and connect our communities to more resources. Imagine if your one-week vacation really meant one week at your destination without days spent traveling, or if that destination was somewhere you thought you'd never go. At NASA, we imagine a future where communities are more connected, ideas flow more freely, and inspiration comes from everyone and everywhere. Sky for All means millions of airborne operations every day with a variety of aircraft. It means keeping our skies safe, affordable, and efficient. We're developing concepts and technologies today to ensure that aviation systems are ready for the vehicles, users, and businesses of tomorrow. NASA, imagining what the future holds. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, and welcome back. And welcome to the Imagine Aviation panel session on Sky for All, Imagining an Integrated Dynamic Aerospace System. My name is Barb Esker with the NASA Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, and I'm honored to serve as the moderator for this panel. Before we jump in, I'd like to remind the audience to use the conference IO system for asking questions, which will be very important for our later discussion. Aviation is the most diverse form of transportation, especially considering the advent of autonomous aerial vehicles and emergence of commercial supersonic and potentially hypersonic aircraft, new high altitude operations, and new business models that, cha that daily challenge the status quo. Traditionally, our National Aerospace System, or NAS, has been segregated by altitudes, missions, and vehicle behavior. But today and tomorrow's NASA is truly surface to space. NASA and the FAA are at the forefront of imagining what this holistic aerospace system will look like and what capabilities will be needed to enable it. Enhancing safety, prioritizing sustainability, and ensuring equitable access are three of our most pressing priorities. These goals provide fertile ground for our research into the dynamic airspace management. I'm pleased to introduce a distinguished panel to explore the ways in which we need to work together to usher in the next golden era of aviation and aerospace. I will first introduce our panelists and then each panelist will give six minutes of opening comments. We will then turn to the conference IO site to answer questions submitted by you, our audience. First, I'd like to introduce Parimal Kopardiaker or PK. PK serves as the director of the NASA Aeronautics Research Institute, or NARI. In this capacity, he's responsible for exploring new trends, research areas, collaborations, and partnerships relevant to the aeronautics enterprise. Recently, he co-led a comprehensive needs assessment to study, comprehensive needs assessment study for wildfire mitigations. Previously, he served as the NASA senior technologist for air traffic management systems. PK and Venon, the Unmanned Aircraft System Traffic Management or UTM system to safely enable large scale drone operations at low altitudes, which is now being globally adopted. He also chairs the International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO's Unmanned Aircraft Systems Advisory Group. PK holds a doctorate in philosophy and a master of science degree in industrial engineering and a bachelor's degree in production engineering. Next, we have Mauricio Rivas, Mauricio is the Deputy Branch Chief of the Aeronautics Projects Branch under the Programs and Projects Directorate at NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, California. In his current position, he is a supervisor of most of the center's project managers supporting NASA Aeronautics. 
Recently, Mauricio was the project manager of the Unmanned Aircraft System Integration in the NAS, or the UAS in the NAS project. In that role, Mauricio led the final stages of execution and closeout of a very successful project that transferred data, analyses, and technical knowledge to the broader community. This UAS in the NAS project successfully informed the development of minimum operational performance standards, or MOPs, addressing areas critical to enable UAS operation in the NAS. Mauricio earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering with a minor in Business Administration and a Master's of Science in System Architecting and Engineering from the University of Southern California. Next, I'd like to introduce Peter Cohen. Peter currently serves as the Mission Integration Manager for NASA's Low Boom Flight Demonstration Mission. His primary responsibility in this role is to ensure that the X-59 aircraft development, the in-flight acoustics validation, and the community test planning elements of the low boom mission stay on track towards delivering on NASA's critical commitment of providing quiet supersonic overflight response data to the FAA and ICAO. Peter has worked at NASA for over 38 years, including 12 years as a project manager. During his career, he has studied technology integration and practical designs for many different types of aircraft and has made technical and management contributions to all of NASA's supersonics related programs over the last 25 years. Peter holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering from the Polytechnic Institute of New York and a Master's degree in Aeronautical Engineering from George Washington University. And batting cleanup is Sean Englund. Sean currently serves as the Acting Deputy Manager for NASA's Air Traffic Management Exploration Project. He also leads NASA's Sky for All Vision Development Team. Previously, Sean managed NASA's recently completed Airspace Technology Demonstrations, or ATD, project, which included the ATD Integrated Arrival Departure Surface, or IADS, field demonstration. The IADS Single Airport Demo in Charlotte, North Carolina, validated surface departure metering and overhead stream insertion capabilities that the FAA will deploy to 27 airports via the Terminal Flight Data Manager implementation. The multi-airport demo in North Texas extended IADS to improve the efficiency of surface operations as departures from multiple airports compete for constrained terminal airspace resources. Prior to his involvement in air traffic management research, Sean served in the Flight Dynamics and Controls branch at the NASA Ames Research Center. His research there focused on advanced flight control concepts for high-speed civil transports and for advanced short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft. Sean earned bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in aerospace engineering from the University of Kansas and began his career at NASA Ames in 1986 as a participant in NASA's post-baccalaureate program. And with those introductions, I'd like to turn it over to PK. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for that uh, warm introduction and really glad to be with the STEAM panel here. Thank you for moderating this panel. Uh, you put together a really good um, uh, set of people and a diverse, um, interesting topic. So thank you for that. And really appreciate the audience for being here for this interesting and exciting activity uh, focused on Imagine Aviation. Um, I'll start off with talking about how the unmanned aircraft system or the drone traffic management system came about. So if you start to look at the current air traffic management system, there are roughly 60,000 operations. One operation is arrival or departure, and at a peak about 7,000 aircraft. And as we started to postulate future in 2012, 2013, we realized that the smart drones could be lot in the quantity as compared with the current air traffic management system. Current air traffic management system has a very focused approach about making sure the air traffic is safe, efficient, and expeditious in that order. And as we started to look at the postulation of the drones, which could be in millions, particularly small drones below 400 feet, we wanted to make sure that we can not only maintain the safety and efficiency of operations, but at the same time, we can accommodate the scale without overloading the current air traffic control system. So that was the impetus behind this drone traffic management construct that we started to think about. So we realized that we needed a new construct. 
that the current air traffic system works in a way where all the information is presented to the air traffic controller on a display and every change by pilot has to be basically cleared by air traffic controller because only air traffic control system and controller has the situation awareness of what's going on in the airspace. So we wanted to change that paradigm. We moved towards a new paradigm for enabling this volume and the density and the diversity of drones, which could be order magnitude different than the current aviation. So we looked at creating a cooperative digital intent sharing through software using service oriented architecture with third parties offering services rather than only government providing services and moving towards management by exception paradigm. The current paradigm is management by clearance or management by permission because information is only re residing in the air traffic control system. But we realize that if we share that information about each other's existence and with the location through digital means in a cooperative manner, we can create a share and care environment and that will allow us to have third parties to provide services and migrate towards management by exception. So instead of saying every step of the way you can get clearance or permission, you can say what not to do. So once we realize what not to do, the businesses can optimize their trajectories based on the operational needs because they have information about who else is in the sky. So that is sort of the foundation of the unmanned aircraft system traffic management or the UTM. Now, this is a big undertaking to try to change the paradigm from management by permission to management by exception. So we divided the basically research, development, technology, testing and transfer into segments, what we characterize as technology capability levels, pretty much using NASA's tested basically methodology of build a little, test a little, and implement a little, or deploy a little. So in the technology capability levels, we started off with very low risk environment. So we took the risk-based approach. We looked at the remote operations first with low density, no basically risk on the ground or any other aircraft or any other assets. And then we demonstrated how this digital intent sharing environment will work. Then we added that with unmanned system and a manned system. So first we tested in cross landing in California, then we migrated towards all FAA test sites, and we tested in all test sites with manned and unmanned system working together. Then we increased the density and went beyond visual line of sight. And the last segment of technology capability level was to test in the urban setting. So we tested in Reno and Corpus Christi in interesting environments where there is challenges for GPS and communications. So we demonstrated the feasibility of this entire system. In the meantime, as we were showing the interesting feasibility uh, uh, considerations, working very closely with industry, FAA realized that this may be a really good way to actually get these drones accommodating in the national airspace system without overloading the current air traffic control system and without having government to provide all the services. So FAA started the UTM pilot project, phase one, phase two. Now we are on to a UTM field testing that's going to occur pretty soon. Uh, so we are going to launch that in, in on March 14th. So please look out for that. As the success of UTM demonstrated, then we realized that, oh, this can be also useful for upper airspace, which is 60,000 feet and up, where there are no services provided currently, where there are similar situations occur. We also realized it can be applicable to space traffic management above Karman line. So we are looking into creating a space traffic management. At the same time, we realized this, the tenets of this service-oriented architecture, intent sharing through digital means, as well as cooperative operations is also useful for urban air mobility and advanced air mobility, which is 4,000 feet and below. All of a sudden, we started to realize that the applications for the UTM construct are now growing in its scope, and it will support the diversity, the scale, the efficiency, and safety at the same time. So that's how basically we migrated from a very small chunk of a disruptive innovative idea, which was 
focused originally from 400 feet and below for only small drones to increasing complexity and scalability. So the fundamental premise here that we want to accomplish is airspace system needs to be ready when the vehicles are ready. As soon as the vehicles get ready, we need to make sure that the system is able to handle them. Provide as much flexibility as possible to the operators uh, and structure only when you need it. You don't want to put too much structure if you don't have to. So flexibility were possible, structure were absolutely necessary, integration were possible, and segregation where it's absolutely necessary. So those are the tenets that we learned from the UTM. And uh, the goal was to simultaneously get to the safety, efficiency, and orderly flow. And we demonstrated that. And now we are migrating towards increasingly more complex and upper airspace, including all the way to the space traffic management. So thank you, Barbara, for giving me opportunity to share what we learned. And I will hand over to my good friend Mauricio Rivers for sharing how he has captured the imagination with the larger drones. Okay. Well, thank you, PK. And um, as PK mentioned, uh, my experience has been more with um, UAS, the larger kind. And in fact, most of my career I've been working on UAS. Um, when, when I hear the imagining aviation's topics of inspire, invigorate, infuse, I can't help but think what I've experienced through my career at NASA. So indulge me for a few minutes here as I walk you down memory lane from um, my experiences. Um, at the turn of the century, NASA wanted to inspire and promote the development of new sensing capabilities for Earth science and environmental research, um, equipping unmanned airplanes. Uh, seemed like a good approach to do that, especially when you were looking at going to the extremes of high altitude and long endurance. Um, as a result, the Environmental Research Aircraft and Sensor Technology Program was established. While ERES was around, um, in addition to advancing the sensing technology for science applications, uh, the program helped inspire today's UAS industry. Um, several industry partners that participated with us back then with the ERES um, have gone on to advance their UAS technologies for commercial and military applications. Notably, the predecessors to the MQ-1 and the MQ-9 were vehicles that General Atomics developed as part of their um, ERAS work with us. Um, NASA's early UAS missions uh, were performed in restricted or segregated airspace. Um, eventually, we obtained some of our first Certificate of Waiver Authorizations, or COAS, um, from the FAA when we started flying the Kana UAS in support of fire missions. It, it was around the, the mid 2000s that NASA acquired the Kana UAS, a civilianized uh, Predator Reaper UAS, um, the General Atomics manufacturer. Um, we used the Kana to support science missions like the fire mission, space missions like the Orion uh, re entry over the Pacific, um, and technology development missions. Several of those we, we collaborated with DOD. In the process um, of executing these missions, NASA developed a, a good approach for working with the FAA to obtain these calls to support our missions. Um, during this time, the FAA also matured and, and, and improved the call application process. Nonetheless, the, in, in order to fly a UAS in the NAS, um, the safety chase was still required through Class E to reach Class A. Um, and for a long time, COAS were not even available to um, uh, non-government organizations. So finding out how to eliminate the need for these uh, safety chase um, aircraft when, when you acquired a COA was one of the goals that the UAS integration in the NAS project had, um, which was established um, um, by NAS around the 2010s, uh, in the early 2010s. Um, in order to reap the benefits of the capabilities that these UAS, that these vehicles afforded us uh, for commercial and civil applications and to better access the, the, the mask, in other words, access it without um, uh, uh, safety chase, was something that we believe we needed to, to do. Um, so um, we believe that access, um, that this type of access without a safety chase could invigorate a new industry, a growing industry. And the U.S. and the NASA project leveraged its close collaborations with 
um, industry and the FDA, um, both directly and through standards organization, um, working with standards organizations would um, uh, prove to be a very productive forum for us, um, enabling us to better inform, to be better informed of what industry and the FAA uh, stakeholders needed from us, um, thus allowing us to design and adjust our flight test and data collection and analyses um, to better address their needs. So in phase one of the um, UAS and the NAS project, um, it resulted in um, RTCA, a partner standard organization with us, establishing minimum operational performance standards or MOPs um, for direct uh, um, and for detect and avoid systems um, and for radar and um, air to air radar capabilities. And they worked on this around 2017. Um, these MOPs effectively address the minimum performance you need for a UAS to safely transit um, to uh, class D, e, e, and G airspace. Um, in, in, uh, from above 400 feet to Class A uh, without a safety chase. Um, these months led to the um, respective FAA technical standard orders or TSOs um, for, for these areas. And in 2018, using the Econa UAS, NASA demonstrated how to um, meet these TSOs and uh, we performed a no chase co op flight demonstration for the first time. Um, in, to further invigorate the industry, um, the UAS Integration and Mass Project established a systems integration and operationalization activity, the SIO activity, um, which um, was a collaboration between the industry and, uh, um, and, our, our, and the FAA in, in NASA. Um, our industry partners uh, proposed commercial missions using their UAS and leveraged the work that NASA had already uh, done to obtain FAA approvals um, on their proposed uh, operations. And, and this advanced the, 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 their opportunities to obtain certifications later on. Um, all three of our partners were General Atomics, Bell, and AATI, or uh, American Aerospace Technologies. They each were able to demonstrate their proposed um, uh, operations without chase and the NAS. Um, between 2020 and 2021. Um, General Atomics has since gone ahead and has already leveraged the work that they did with SIO to fly without chase in Asia, Europe, and other parts of North America. Um, through, through our UAS operations over the years, we had um, to implement growing levels of autonomy by necessity. Um, but now there are growing opportunities for autonomy and other technologies to help infuse um, safety while integrating different types of vehicles into the future NAS. So collaboration with industry and the FAA will continue to be key for this future. Um, so now let me introduce you uh, to Peter Cohn, who will talk to us about supersonics. Thank you, Mo. Uh, thank you, Barb, and the rest of the panelists, and uh, thank you to the audience for uh, for joining us today for our discussion. I hope we hope you find it interesting. Um, so uh, we're now, we'll, we'll talk a little bit now about uh, larger aircraft um, than the two previous panelists and, and faster aircraft. But we'll find, I think, that a lot of the concepts uh, for man air, air traffic management for these types of vehicles are, are similar in nature. Um, so the vision of the supersonics community is, is one where quiet supersonic overland flight will essentially open a new market um, for airline type operations uh, with, with supersonic aircraft that will enable uh, people to travel longer distances um, with greatly reduced travel times. Um, so right now uh, we're a little bit a ways away from that. Um, we are, we have the technology, we believe we have the technology in hand to enable quiet supersonic flight. Uh, the X-59 aircraft pictured behind me uh, is nearing completion and will soon be, uh, over the next couple of years, will soon be flying. Uh, we'll be able to prove its its quiet you know, its quiet flight capabilities, but more than that, collect data on response to the sounds from quiet supersonic flight that will um, 
inform uh, international and national rulemaking um, for essentially certain standards uh, similar to those for current subsonic landing and takeoff noise where you must be quiet if, if you're quieter than the limit uh, you can fly over land supersonically now there are some other technical problems you know, challenges and barriers that need to be addressed before widespread supersonic overland operations will will be common uh, but with all this interest in bringing new vehicles into the airspace, now is the time to think about essentially incorporating capabilities in that airspace that will uh, enable uh, quiet supersonic flight and, and supersonic aircraft to operate to the, the, the best extent of their capabilities. And of course, supersonic aircraft generally fly higher than, than most other traffic. Um, and so the primary focus really is when they interface with the subsonic traffic during the, the takeoff uh, and landing phases, you know, the, or the, the, the initial approach, and, um, initial climb to supersonic flight. And there, you know, the really objective from the supersonics community side is to enable the supersonic aircraft to fly at, at high speeds for as, as absolutely long as possible before they integrate with the flow of, of subsonic aircraft. So. You know, the concepts that, that PK mentioned, you know, expanding to uh, essentially four, uh, you know, independent um, vehicle knowledge of all the other vehicles in the airspace and uh, um, being able to do 4D traffic management. You know, we have the vision of being able to kind of open uh, holes in the approach path for supersonic aircraft as they come in without, without unnecessarily penalizing, you know, the subsonic traffic. So, that's kind of the, the key for supersonic operations. Of course, as, as mentioned previously, the, the, the high altitude airspace is now, now potentially going to be occupied by um, other vehicles with significantly different speed capabilities from supersonic aircraft. So when we think about how those vehicles will interact um, and uh, you know, creating a safe space for, for the operations of all of those, again, the, the ability for the, uh, for the uh, users of the airspace to communicate their positions and their intentions um, and essentially pre-plan for uh, avoiding each other is, is, is a capability that the, the new airspace uh, system will give us. There's a couple of other interesting considerations uh, for, for future supersonic flight. Um, as I say, we envision, uh, we envision that, that the aircraft will be quiet enough to fly over land. Um, and but they will not be completely sound free. And so there's the potential that certain operations, uh, particularly during uh, uh, the transition to and from supersonic flight, um, may produce sound levels that, that certain communities are sensitive to. So uh, being able to accommodate um, maneuvers that either avoid those communities or uh, provide additional, uh, almost like, uh, um, noise abatement procedures for subsonic aircraft where the supersonic aircraft does does a maneuver that most aircraft would not do in order to uh, to fly more quietly over a certain area um, again the, the the ability to plan and integrate those operations when you're in an area where you may be interacting with subsonic traffic are, are an important consideration there are some other things um, we you know we're striving to be environmentally compatible um, not just with, with noise, but with emissions. Um, and at the Mach numbers that we're con currently considering for supersonic flight, we're kind of in a transition area where altitude um, can either hurt or uh, benefit you in terms of uh, your emissions impact. Uh, that may be weather dependent for a particular day. So again, being able to adjust in real time um, the, the flight trajectories of, of supersonic aircraft um, are, are, are a potential benefit uh, for, uh, for the environment as well. Um, so, th so there's lots of, uh, lots of details, you know, the, lots of details about supersonic flight that are intriguing from an airspace perspective. Um, and we're interested in, in seeing the, how things develop uh, in the future and how, how those developments can, can aid in the solution to those challenges. So for, for our last panelist, I'm going to turn it over to Sean, uh, who's going to talk about all of these things uh, from an ATM uh, perspective. So thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter.
Uh, my pleasure uh, to my be pleasure. A part of the panel today. And as was mentioned in the opening remarks of the biography, I've just come off of being the project manager for the Airspace Technology Demonstrations Project. And uh, in that project, uh, we focused on demonstrating mature, or in NASA language, high technology readiness level, or TRL technologies, via three major demonstration activities. Um, our ATD-1 activity demonstrated flight deck and ground-based technologies to improve the efficiency of arrival operations. ATD-2 demonstrated ground-based technologies to improve the predictability and uh, efficiency of surface and departure operations and the integration of those. And ATD-3 demonstrated the flight deck and ground based technologies to improve the efficiency of en route operations in the presence of weather and other constraints. And so uh, that project successfully completed uh, back in as planned back in November. And in line with today's uh, theme of Infuse, uh, that was really the hallmark of the ATD uh, demonstrations, was infusing NASA technology, getting it out of the lab and into the field and into implementation. So these demonstrations within the Airspace Technology Demonstrations Project were co conducted in close collaboration with our FAA and industry partners, and industry being both the flight operators and solution providers, uh, vehicle manufacturers, avionics manufacturers, air traffic management solution providers. And then the big focus was to transfer these NASA de developed technologies to the FAA and industry to help implement the next gen air transportation system or next gen vision. And uh, so I, you know, kind of just to wrap up the, the section on ATD, it's, it's I, I think it's really encouraging to see that NASA Aeronautics really is with you when you fly. Uh, every day when you fly, you'll see some of these ATD technologies out there in the field supporting the current day aviation system, the current day flight operators. We're really excited about that. Uh, now switching gears a little bit, my, my current job is uh, leading the Sky for All team. And we, uh, uh, so we're now imagining the future instead of demonstrating these high technology readiness level technologies. And um, the motivation for this is with the next gen, the next gen air transportation system nearing completion, nearing full implementation, both NASA and the FAA are looking to um, a vision for the future that will guide our our research and development requirements. Now, how are we going to invest our resources to make the most impact um, within uh, industry uh, and within the aviation system? And we're, we're doing this in partnership with our FAA colleagues. Uh, the FAA uh, has an initiative known as Operations in an Infocentric National Airspace System or Infocentric NAS. And that focuses on some of the nearer term needs that are going to be required to achieve the future aviation system. NASA's initiative is known as Sky for All, which is focusing on the further term, the mid, mid 21st century needs. We're working really closely with our FAA partners to harmonize and align these two initiatives so that they, they, they really seamlessly flow towards this future vision of the, of the aviation system. So for, for the NASA Sky for All initiative, we have a, our mandate is to develop a community supported vision of the mid-century aviation system. And it's really important to understand that this is not NASA's vision. This is all of our vision. It's, this aviation system belongs to all of us and the future generations. It's a, and so we are, uh, we've, um, taken the mandate to get community support for this vision and, and turned it into co-developing the vision, working together with the community of stakeholders to bring, to imagine what the future ought to be like and to, um, to articulate that so that it can be used to help plan a research portfolio that will get us there and, and the time we want to be there. So to accomplish this co-development, to um, elicit and incorporate stakeholder input, uh, what we've done first and foremost is to publish the vision, to communicate the vision via an interactive web portal. 
And that portal is set up to be able to accept input from anyone, really. We, we launched the portal in mid-December. We invited people to come comment on it. And, and here with um, Imagine Aviation, we're, we're making it more public and, and inviting anyone and everyone to provide input into the future of the aviation system. Um, in addition to having the portal uh, for you to come and interactively interact with the vision and provide your feedback, We'll also be conducting a series of workshops and webinars to solicit input from select groups. And in fact, we are conducting one of those workshops as part of Imagine Aviation this week. And, and so later today in the Gather Town event, you can come in and, and work with us to help envision the future. And when we'll take your input and roll it into the next version of the vision as it gets published. So let me encourage you to come by our gather town event later today please stop by and give us your input and also visit the web portal and provide our, your input there back to you barb thanks sean thank you for your, for your remarks each of you and as a reminder to our audience please use the conference io system to submit questions or to upvote questions that are already there i would also encourage our panelists to pose questions to each other and uh, make this a, a truly three-way conversation. So I'd like to start with the first question that was in the um, upvoted in the conference IO system, and this goes uh, to PK. And the question reads, um, as and, and I quote, the FA has not adopted UTM outside of trials. They did not support the, the network remote ID. What is keeping them from seeing the value? Yeah, it's a great question, and I'm not sure the question is completely accurate. Uh, I would say that the UTM is collection of services, or remote ID is one of them. Other is the information about the intent and FA and the USS framework. So the whole architecture of UTM looks like that there is a third party services, what we call US support, the service suppliers, USS. There is a flight information in uh, flight information management system that's on the FAA side, and there are supplemental data providers. So FAA has already adopted the whole construct of USS, so US support, US service suppliers, US service suppliers, USS, and that's been implemented as part of the low altitude authorization and notification capability lands, and that's already adopted at many, many airports. Now, the specific question about the network remote ID, so there was a dis lot of discussion and debate about what is the right method of remote ID. One is broadcast and one is basically network. So remote ID is one of the essential services of UTM. So FIA has adopted the remote ID service. The specific implementation of remote ID uh, originally was thought about uh, network as well as broadcast, but realizing that the network access wasn't always available in some of the places where they were looking for I think that's one of the reasons why it went uh, as an initial step towards the broadcast remote ID. So the remote ID service has been adopted. It just adopted with the broadcast. Now, I believe that as we mature in the UTM and as we mature towards beyond visual line of sight with multiple aircraft operating in the same airspace in the beyond visual line of sight manner at the same time, you would need those network systems. So in my personal view, they are coming. They will be sort of required after the individual beyond visual line of sight type of certification comes through. The next step up would be how do you actually enable a lot of these beyond visual line of sight aircraft at the same time in the same place because nobody can see them. So you need to have a network to be able to detect conflicts and strategically as well as uh, planning wise so I think this that is in my personal view that's coming it's just taking its time step by step making sure that the system is able to handle the things and we are going to be able to keep up with the requirements of the external community particularly the users and operators in a time at which they need certain services and operations to occur so it's a balance of both and so it's in my personal view I'll just summarize that it's going to happen, the UTM will happen because it's essential. Without that, there is no multiple simultaneous BV loss operations in the same airspace. 
Thanks, PK. So I had taken a couple notes of uh, my own and I have a few questions. So um, I'd like to turn to um, Mauricio and, and given some of the comments that PK just made and some of the description that Sean provided for the Sky for All, my question for you, Mauricio, is um, given Sean's description of the Sky for All vision, how did the successes from the UAS in the NAS project both inform or perhaps contribute to our foundation for this Sky for All initiative? Um, in other words, you know, what did we learn through that project that helps inform us looking forward? And so the main thing that comes to my mind as we um, um, went through through our process is, is just that re-emphasis that we need to design safety into every one of our systems, especially these new systems that are um, including new technologies. Um, the whether they're on the aircraft or they're in the airspace uh, infrastructure. Um, we need to integrate safety into, into all, all aspects of the design, um, thinking ahead of time of what is the, 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 the worst thing that we may need to address. Um, we don't just have to figure out how things operate in normal missions um, or, or just how we want them to, to be optimized. Um, but also address the, those worst cases. Um, what, what would happen if a certain communication is not available? What will happen if it's not there on time um, as you had planned for normal operations? Um, so all these types of new um, uh, um, operations that, that we want to perform, we still need to figure out what what will what could go wrong. And you know, from our experience in, in executing our flights safely, um, we have to do that. And, and you know, the, the, the worst thing you can think of, or one of the worst, you, you can't communicate with the airplane. That happened to us more often than not, to the point that it, we, we knew what to do, to the point that it was normal operations. Um, so what is that normal operations? And how does that affect the people who are flying around you? Um, to to what degree do they need to change what they're doing and how badly will that interfere with them? So all these are, are questions that we need to take into account from, from the um, very beginning. And, and, and I think that was something that, that has helped in all the um, UAS projects that I've worked in. The, the more we can think of what to do if we have a really bad day, um, if we design that into our systems, that's always been helpful. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, now I have another question from the conference IO um, system, and this one's kind of general, so I'd like to open it to the entire panel. The question reads as follows, um, with changes coming to the NAS, what new safety technologies, procedures, and methods must be introduced? And conversely, what legacy systems, technologies, procedures, and methods should be leveraged? So I'll start with that and then invite the other panelists to chime in. Um, from, from my perspective, um, well, first of all, I would refer folks to um, to the Sky for All portal and, and you'll see their principles and aspirations. And those are really the guardrails and the guidelines for taking us to the future. And one of the principles and aspirations is building on what currently works, building on the current system. Don't throw out the good stuff, you know, that we currently have, but but then transform it to to be able to accommodate the increasing diversity and complexity of of both vehicle types and operation types. That's that's really the big challenge: is the increasing volume, diversity, and complexity of the operations while maintaining the very high levels of safety that we already have, maintaining or improving on those. So two of the thing, two of the new capabilities that are really evident that need to be there is safety just embedded in the DNA of the system, you know, um, more innovative safety than we than we currently have to increase, uh, to handle the complexity and the diversity. And then uh, digita digitization, you know, being able to digitally exchange information very rapidly to address some of those things that Peter was talking about earlier about ex exchanging antenna information between operators of different vehicle types so that they can de-conflict um, in real time. So I'll turn it over to, I see PK has got his hand up, so turn it over to PK. Well, yeah, well said, Sean, and I'll just uh, add a few more nuggets to that. 
the current air traffic management system has layers of safety built in. So at the very core, it's the co collision avoidance with TKS. Then there is a conflict detection. Then there is a strategic deconfliction that goes into over 10 minute period for detecting conflicts. And on top of that, there is a flow management so that the demand capacity imbalance is modulated. So there are layers of this safety built in to make sure that not everybody shows up at the same time at the same place. So uh, that's sort of one of the tenets of the air, air traffic management system. And over a period of time, we had done, uh, Sean was instrumental in many of those, in making sure that that, that layering is become more automated. And I think personally that will continue to be the tenant in the future system as well. So you have layering or layered protection to ensure the safety. So you don't really have to get to that collision avoidance if you can avoid. So that's that sort of will continue. Now what will be the new and exciting part is that as we move towards more and more automation, automated system, autonomous vehicles and learning systems, we need newer safety methods. So most of the safety methods that have been used right now are require deterministic understanding of what the outcomes will be. If you have X, then Y happens. So now we have learning systems and adaptive systems and autonomous systems. How do you make sure that our new ways of doing things without having human oversight? So human is not in the loop because in today's system, human serves as the last element to detect and avoid and protect the entire safety of the operation. And if we are getting away from that because of the density, diversity, and the complexity, because we need automation to support that and less dependence on human, how do you make sure that these systems and the automation autonomy and software systems are able to maintain that behavior that will be the safe? So that is one of the interesting aspects of system-wide safety project is working on to develop new methods to ensure that the behaviors of the system will not violate the protocols and the safety expectation. So that's a really exciting research that's going on. And the last point I'll make is, as we move towards Sky for All and Sean's vision uh, and the community build up towards that, now we are going towards a simultaneous objective function of safety, efficiency, and expediency. Right now, safety first, then if you have time, you do efficiency in their orderly flow. Now, moving towards future because of the diversity and density and time criticality of operations like space, everything has to happen at the same time. And that requires much more dependence on automation and safe, new safety methods. Thank you, PK. Any other panelists want to weigh in on that particular one um, before I raise another question? No. Um, so, so, so far, a lot of this conversation is focused on the U.S. Uh, National Airspace System, or NAS, um, but we do operate within a global context and a global system. You know, and, and I think about the commercial supersonic aircraft um, that are going to operate, you know, beyond the bounds of this country. So a question for Peter, um, when it comes to commercial supersonic aircraft operations, um, what role does the international community play in influencing or connecting into the USA, the US NAS and their guidance and standards? So I don't, I, I don't, Bob, I don't, I don't really think that supersonics has anything unique in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges that are faced in international operations. I mean, we, we really do take for granted right now that, you know, um, aircraft certified in the US or else, you know, and certified internationally will, will experience the airspace system uh, as they fly you know, to another country in much the same way that they, they do now. Um, you know, in NASA's current efforts uh, in, in developing and, and um, fielding, uh, helping to field uh, new airspace technology, we, we do work very closely with uh, the ICAO um, and the international research community um, to make sure that um, those things move forward in, in, in you know, in, in harmony, in, in in a synchronous fashion. I know from, from the perspective of um, rules related to uh, to supersonic flight and, and, and quiet, particularly the standards for quiet supersonic aircraft, you know, that, that's our, fo our focus is this is not a, this is not a, a, a one nation only product. This is a product that will need to operate internationally. So 
any standards, uh, the standards that we're working on, we're, we, we are uh, intimately involved with the ICAO uh, Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection, which sets those standards. And so I think the expectation would be that as we will look to those other barriers to supersonic flight, that we would continue to engage with the, you know, the right elements of the international community to make sure that um, you know, what's put in place is acceptable and usable uh, from an international perspective. Thank you. So I'd like to go back to the conference I.O. Uh, system. And then the next question that has been upvoted uh, is for PK. It says, how does NASA measure success of the UTM program? And specifically, um, options are commercial adoption, FA ad adaptation or other business metrics. Great question, and you know the answer. I think the 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 person who asked the question actually answered it some ways. FAA has already adopted uh, CONAPS. They've done the two UTM pilot projects. The field test is coming. Their budget uh, is in one year budget. In my view, is more than NASA's entire budget for UTM was uh, was for the entire project for five years. So I think that that just shows you the level of um, basically commitment that FIA is showing towards adoption of UTM. And uh, so FIA has already adopted the USS, the un unmanned aircraft system service supplier model. And the architecture that we talked about with the service suppliers, the supplemental data providers, the flight information management, and the connectivity and management by exception, that moment is already occurring through LANs and other means. Globally, it's already adopted through IKO's uh, Unmanned Aircraft System Advisory Group. If you just look at industry, uh, every major industry that's doing drones have a UTM, uh, basically project or product lead. Very recently, I just saw, not that I'm advocating anybody do that, but I just saw a job posting by Wing for UTM lead. So there are people who are hiring, the, the industry is hiring UTM leads and UTM system integrators and providers. So that sort of is a way that you can see that the impact of UTM is already occurring from the ANSP side, which is the <clears throat> navigation service provider side, as well as the industry side and a global adoption side. And by the way, we already have UTM principles in the upper e-traffic management where Peter's vehicles will be uh, cruising through rapidly uh, with the 4D manner along with others, you know, possibly balloons and other vehicles. So we see that happening and uh, we are seeing UTM's impact also in the constructs that we are building for urban air mobility towards uh, you know, maturity level four, which is medium density, medium complexity, and automated system. So we've seen the tenets of UTM migrating in many places, including space traffic management, which is above carbon line. Uh, so anyway, my, my main point is uh, there is an adoption happening. Uh, sometimes I feel that uh, NASA is too fast for FA and too slow for industry, but in general, uh, uh, progress has been made. All right, thank you, PK. So I had a, a question of my own, and it dovetails um, quite well with one that was in the conference um, I/O system. So, and it and it's for Sean. So, in addition to the three vehicle categories that we've highlighted here, you know, the drones, the larger UAS, and commercial supersonics, what other types of vehicles, you know, including you know, human spaceflight vehicles, um, need to be accommodated in this future ATM and in the sky for all vision? Uh, excellent question, and hopefully that came through in the opening video. That was our Sky for All video, and you saw just a, a mind-numbing number of different types of operations and vehicles. Uh, so we've talked about small UAS, big, uh, bigger drones, and supersonics here on this panel. Uh, obviously, a big one is the, the emerging market for the urban air transportation, you know, the UAM, AAM vehicles. Those new entrants are going to be a big player. And then Peter mentioned the, the high E, upper E, above 60,000 feet uh, operators of the, the balloons or the slow flying solar powered aircraft that his supersonics are going to have to take into account. 
So you've got this immense diversity of operations. And then speaking of space flight, you saw some rockets in our video too. We, we aren't going to claim to do space traffic management, but there, those, those uh, ro rockets have to fly through and return through the airspace where that's occupied with aircraft. So the integrating that all together, an aviation system that accounts for all those different sorts of operations and enables it to be done safely and with equity and with efficiency and sustainability is really the key that we're going for. Thank you, Barb. Thanks, Sean. So, so the next question from the conference I.O. could be answered by uh, any of you, and it reads as follows. Um, what is the biggest barrier to coordination of multiple agencies and multiple companies in, in getting this vision to happen and in sending all of these types of vehicles into the air safely and efficiently? Bert had on a, you know, as far as when he was going about NASA being fast or slow, you know, we we have the challenge of the different time horizons that different organizations, you know, industry and government work on, and how far the tech transfer needs to be taken. You know, it's all about that the baton handoff. You know, NASA is only successful when we can make that impact with that tech transfer. And sometimes we have to carry the baton farther than, than we imagined we would to have that successful handoff. So I'd say that's one of our big challenges is just syncing up with the needs of our partners. What do they need to be able to successfully take what we're trying to give them? Anyone else? Yeah, I would foot stamp that for sure, Sean. I mean, multiple agencies have different interests and you know, we learned this through UTM. Uh, as just going through the process, DOD, DH is their interest about the security, making sure that the counter systems are in place uh, for unwanted or rogue drones, FIA's needs for ensuring that the compatibility with the rest of the airspace system operations and ensuring the safety of not just the drones, but drones and other aircraft and NASA's need for innovation and push and industry wants to see that the fruits of their technology are converted into use cases and applications and eventually businesses, right? So there are some diverging needs and sometimes they can be at uh, odds with the pace in which they are expected. And our job collectively is to balance all those needs. And it's been a, it's been a really rewarding experience to try to understand those needs and how do you actually put that system together that will satisfy all those. And as Sean mentioned, as we move forward, now we have space entrance. So space, commercial space industry is rapidly growing. And, but the, the interesting part of this is the tenants that we talked about is cooperative intent sharing and all of that's what's going to keep everybody's interest basically aligned because now we create the share and care environment rather than one system that is basically centralized but more federated so that everybody has a play everybody has a ability to access the airspace and then share the information and you can dynamically adapt based on the changes thanks pk peter i uh, just thinking uh, you know I, every, I think it, both uh, Sean and, and PK, you know, hit the nail on the head. There's just such a diversity of requirements um, from all the participants, and you know, every, every each participant really needs to, uh, you know, not only just you know review and establish you know requirements that are appropriate for them, but also communicate them. And then you know the the challenge, and it's a it's a significant challenge. And you know, like, as PK mentioned, there's been progress here and there, but you know. Finding a framework uh, and a system that is flexible enough to ensure that you know most of everybody's requirements uh, gets met, and and getting everybody on board to participate in that framework, there you know that's that's no small pole to climb. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter. So I've just been given a one minute mark, so I'm going to do a real quick lightning round for all four of you. Last question, 15 seconds each. What do you feel is the most exciting opportunity in your respective fields? Well, that's an easy that's an easy one for me. You know, break, 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 breaking the sound barrier for the rest of us. Um, you know, actually enabling uh, everybody to take advantage of, of supersonic flight and, and how close we are to that. That's just really exciting. Thanks, Peter. Sean? 
Oh, for me, it's, uh, you know, this new challenge of imagining the future, you know, with, uh, with a whole lot of people. And, and we have a lot of really great input coming in. It's very exciting and mind expanding. So, Thank you. Mauricio? I would say automation and being able to implement automation to improve safety. Thank you. And pre-K? Yeah, I mean, my personal dream is to make sure that the airspace system is ready when the vehicles are ready, so we don't have to have vehicle operators and manufacturers wait to get airspace system ready to enable their operations, getting them access. Oh, well, thank you. So, so now I'd like to wrap up this panel session. First, uh, I'd like to thank our panelists. You guys have done a great job in getting giving us plenty to think about. And I'd like to extend a tremendous thank you to, to all of you, our audience. We really appreciate your engagement and the questions that you've posed. And now as we wrap this up, I'd like to remind everyone that we are scheduled to go into a break. So thank you very much and have a really good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob.